Good afternoon, Christ followers. This is Sean from Light Words Today, and we're beginning a new series, the Scripture Immersion Series, Episode 1, where we dig deep into God's Word, we draw out nuggets of understanding, spiritual truth, as well as, hopefully, application that we can actually put into practice in our lives. Welcome, God bless, let's have a great time as we study deeper into God's Word. Welcome back, and today we're looking at Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48. I'm going to read the text to you, and then I'm going to show you how we dig deep into the Word of God and draw out the nuggets that are there, and how to do that in a way that will bless your life and help you to really get a grasp and an understanding of God's Word. So Luke chapter 8, 43 to 48, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And let me begin. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, Jesus' garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was appealed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now what is our goal today? When we look at this scripture, we are seeking to draw out from the scripture truth about God, about ourselves, about how we might respond or react in a similar circumstance as this story reveals. So the goal today is to draw out and discover the wonders of this passage, to draw out the meaning from the scripture, allowing the scripture to determine the meaning. So we want to avoid putting the lens of our own culture, our own worldview, our denomination on the scripture. We want the scripture to speak for itself. And from it, we draw a truth or truths about God, about ourselves, about how we should live. And I believe that this series is of the Lord. I say that because I just felt overwhelming joy to share this series with you. And I welcome anyone who has a particular verse or passage you would like me to dig deep into for you. We can highlight that in the near future. And What we want to avoid, if at all possible, is to not put our own suppositions, our predetermined positions on the scripture. We want to dig deep into the Word of God, and we want to draw out of it the impact that God surely intends. I feel great joy of excitement to present this series and I just pray that you'll join me and feel free to leave a comment share with your friends and please like the video if it's impacted you because I want this channel to prosper and to grow and it'll only happen when enough people 
do their little part and share it with others or like it or comment. Okay, so we're ready to go forward. I've basically mapped out 10 points, a blueprint on how to get the most out of the scripture. We want to make the two-dimensional words of the scripture become three-dimensional. We want it to become real. I promise that by the end of this video, this passage will be popping out. You will have a greater appreciation for this story. You'll understand God in a greater way. You'll understand perhaps how we should respond to people around us who are hurting or maybe have been ostracized, cut off. And I pray that we will have a great time. So let's get into this. Okay, so I've got 10 steps. And these 10 steps will help you to get a full picture of the scripture and to really dig deep and really be blessed. 10 steps to immersive Bible study. And number one, we want to read the passage, preferably aloud. You'll get more out of the passage if you read it aloud. Number two, begin by praying. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. If we were to pray and turn to the Lord to ask for his wisdom and his insight, we would receive. Number three, we want to write down our initial thoughts about the passage. This is key because it is personal and it will allow you to bring yourself into the passage. If we don't do this now, we risk other voices supplanting our own voice and our own thoughts about the passage. So we want to write down our initial, initial thoughts about the passage. And you should do this in your journal. Maybe you would use your phone for this, whatever it means but there should be a writing down of your initial thoughts about the passage. So we want to record what the Holy Spirit may be showing us. It's important that we allow God to use this moment to reveal things to us. And this is very important in this process. And the fourth is to go through the passage and note key words. And we'll be doing that in just a few moments. Point five would be do an analysis of the passage. Ask critical questions that may shape the meaning or truths. What kind of questions? Who is the author? Who is the audience? Original audience. What is the setting and this would be referencing geography history or cultural phenomenons um, for example we could be speaking about um, a moment in history where the Jewish people are under oppression by the Romans or the Egyptians or whomever it may be and this would have significance on the meaning of the passage and or give us clues or a bigger picture of the passage. And this can be important. Number six would be to check alternative versions. And this can really give a powerful glimpse into the original language and just a fuller picture of the passage. And you'll see this in just a few moments. And then seven, you wanna look at the key words to be able to 
look deeper. That's going to give us a lot of clues, a lot of new information that will add to the beauty of the passage. And we will do that by looking into the original language, whether it's Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. And eight, we will consult. Notice I say the word consult. Background commentaries. This will enrich your understanding of the scripture passage in an incredible way. Uh, looking at the background will remove your own cultural perspective or perception and put on the passage a meaning that will be closer to the original intent of the author. Background commentaries are really important. We miss out when we do not give them proper place in our studies. And then part nine would be looking at consulting other commentary sources. But I will say that this is consultation only. It's very important that we allow the Word of God to supersede anything that any man may bring to the table as far as understanding a passage. We want the scripture to always be supreme. And a commentary is merely a another person's viewpoint. It could be educated viewpoint. It could be a more of a greater grasp of the original language and biblical times. Just it could be someone who, who does have credentials. But I will take the Holy Spirit's credentials over any theologian, any denominational stance. I want the scripture to be true. I don't want to put on a lens that is denominational or that is going to distort the full understanding, the full revelation of the scripture. And then 10, we want to reflect and apply. And how would we do this? Well, you have to wait and find out. But it's going to be amazing. So now we've already read the passage earlier for Luke 8, 43 to 48. But we need to pray. And this is really the most important aspect to our study, any study in the Word of God. We want this Holy Spirit to speak to us to fill us with his wisdom and with his knowledge and also be able to apply this in our daily life father god i just come to you right now and i pray with my brothers and sisters across the world i just pray that you would help us to receive from you your wisdom and your knowledge about this passage and to grow because of this passage May we become more like you, and may we draw closer to you in our actions, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our daily life. And we pray for this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so now we're on step three. Now some of you might be saying, why do we have to go through these ten steps? Well, this is just a blueprint. It's a map to going deeper and digging deeper into the Word of God. You may skip some of these. You may not be interested in some of these. But the most important thing is that we dig into the Word of God and draw out of it the nuggets that are truly there for us. Um, we could just read this passage and that's all we get from it. Or we can ponder it, reflect on it, study it, Go deeper in it and I think we will be better for it this is the Word of God it is living and powerful and it is able to not just speak to our hearts and our minds but it goes into our spirit as well let's erase this and then we'll begin to reflect on this passage 
until we find nuggets, golden nuggets. Not chicken nuggets, golden nuggets. If you want chicken, go somewhere else. Okay, so this uh, initial thoughts about this passage. What do you see when you read this? Okay, so we have a woman with a flow of blood. Questions. This is very important, is ask the questions that you need answers for. And the first question that comes to my mind is, what is this flowing of blood? And we notice that she's been suffering for 12 years. A long time. And had spent her livelihood on getting better. So we have a health issue. Does this affect her in her culture, community. And it says that she came from behind. Why? And she touched the border of his garment. Does this have any significance? And immediately her flow of blood stopped. Jesus asks a strange question in light of the fact that he is being pressed from all around. Who touched me? And Peter, <laughs> brash Peter, he says what he says. Jesus adds that he perceived power going out from him. Power? He sensed power leaving him without his permission. Interesting. The woman comes forward trembling. Trembling? Why? Jesus' response is the daughter be of good cheer your faith has made you well go in peace okay so we've pointed out all of our initial thoughts we've pulled from the text questions that we may have and any observations that come to mind okay so um we want to look at the next step, which is note key words. And what I'd like to do is highlight it's a few that stick out to me. A flow of blood, the border of his garment, perceived power, this phrase, be of good cheer, which we don't hear in today's vernacular, faith, and go in peace. Okay, so I've written down the key words here. So we want to take a look at some of the key facts about this book called the Gospel of Luke. The information that we have today is that it was written by Luke, a physician, close companion of Paul of Tarsus. It may have been written from Rome or in Caesarea. The time frame for this book is about AD 60 and was written before the book of Acts, which is the companion book. This author, Luke, may be the only Gentile author in the New Testament. And the audience is to Theophilus, which actually means one who loves God. This is generally written to a Gentile audience. Other information that is significant is that Luke was written in the context of the growing conflict between the church and the synagogue in the mid to late first century. The early church did not view itself as a new religion, but as the fulfillment and completion 
of Judaism. It was during this time that more and more Gentiles, that is non-Jewish, came into the church while many Jews rejected the good news. Division grew between those who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and those that denied this claim. The pressing question in this conflict became, who are the true people of God? Are they the church made up of Jews and Gentiles who believe that Jesus is the Messiah or are they the Jews who reject Jesus as a false Messiah? Luke addresses this question and demonstrates that Jesus is indeed the Messiah who calls all people, Jew and Gentile, to put their faith in Him. So those are the facts for this book that we see. Okay, so what I've done now is I've gone to Mark and Matthew which also record this story. So whenever there is a parallel version of the story we want to look at those as well because we may see something that is not present in Luke's account and will give a fuller picture and an interesting picture at that. Okay, so I'm going to bring, I'm going to let you see the text as well as I see it. So we're looking at Mark 5, 24. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude throng in you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And now let's look at Matthew for the same story. Okay, so we're looking at Matthew 9.20 forward. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. And she said to him, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Matthew's account is shorter. It's a much shorter version. Uh, Mark's version shows that Jesus actually was searching for her. He felt the power go out from him, and he began to look for her, actively search for her. And that, that's something we don't see in Luke. So it gives a fuller picture. And I like that. How about you? So now I'm going to take a look at this story through different versions or translations. And I believe that this will be a blessing to you. Okay, so I'm now reading from the Wust translation, W-U-E-S-T. And this translation is such a beautiful translation that it is just impossible to ignore. So I'm going to read to you this translation of this story from Luke. And as he was going, the crowds were suffocating him. And a woman afflicted with a flow of blood twelve years, which was of such a nature that it could not be healed by anyone, having come up from behind him, touched the tassel of his outer garment hanging over his shoulder. And immediately the flow of her blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one who touched me? And when all were denying, Peter said, Master, the crowds are pressing in on you and crushing you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for as for myself, I have come to recognize experientially that power has gone out from me. And the woman, having seen that she was not hidden, trembling, came and having 
fallen down before him, made known openly before all the people the reason why she touched him, and how she was immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has restored you to health. Be going on your way into the realm of tranquility. So now let's look at the Amplified version, which is also a good resource, but the Amplified version is, from my perspective, it is a good resource and it is a good study tool to use in your Bible studies. So let's look at this together. And a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years and had spent all her money on physicians and could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his outer robe, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus said, Who touched me? While they all were denying it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the people are crowding and pushing against you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, because I was aware that power to heal had gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came up trembling and fell down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith, your personal trust and confidence in me has made you well. Go in peace, untroubled, undisturbed well-being. Now we're going to go to our next step, which is to examine key words in original language. And specifically, we're going to look at these, the key words here. And let's see what we find out. Okay, so now we're looking at the interlinear, and this can be found at BibleHub.com, which is a great resource place for studying the Word of God. And we're going to look at these key words right here. The first word we're going to look at is Rizai. Rizai, we click on that. It shows that it's there's two occurrences in the scripture. And then if we click on the Strong's Greek, that's where we really want to see the meaning. It generally is translated in the NAS as a hemorrhage or an issue or a flux and then when we look at the Strong's Greek it gives us a uh, definition as a flowing and that seems to be the key. Now we didn't really learn very much from that but it's just good to look and, and just to be able to verify. So let's look at the next word. Again we're checking. We just want to check and see if there's anything of interest, Luke 8.44 is to do with the fringe. Graspadon is the word. And let's look at that. And we see it's being translated as the fringe, the hem. There's five occurrences in the scripture. And they all seem to be related to this story. And let's at, look at the Strong's definition, which says a border a, or a tassel. The fringe, edge, corner, tassel. The hem, border, trim of a garment. It refers to the embroidered border of a garment, especially with conspicuously large tassels. Okay, so we're going to, I think we'll see very shortly how interesting that is. And let's look at the cloak, the word for cloak here, himatu, and it is used 61 times in all of the Bible. It is an outer garment, a cloak or robe. Um, it was often made of wool with openings for the head and arms and worn loosely over the under tunic. Okay, let's see if we can find the next word. And here's the power, dunamin, which should give you a clue as to what it means. Dunamin is the power of God, the ability, the virtue, the miracle mighty work, work of power. Um, it is used 120 times in the scripture. And we want to look at the Greek under Strong's, which says definition is power, might, or strength. It, it often refers to physical power, force, might, ability, efficacy, energy, meaning. Uh, dunamis is a word very closely associated to the Holy Spirit. When the woman's touched the tassel 
on Yeshua, the power that was within him went out. So the power that was within Jesus went out of him when she touched his tassel. So she, she came and fell down before him, prostrate, I believe, to fall prostrate before. So she came and just put her face to the ground in trembling fear. And we will learn why in just a few moments. And here's the word for faith, pistos. In the Greek, it speaks of faith, belief, trust, confidence, fidelity, faithfulness. It is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. So this woman, who has an issue flowing blood for 12 years, she comes up behind Jesus, takes hold of his tassel. The tassel would have been probably at waist level or thereabouts. So basically, the prayer shawl that Yeshua, Jesus, wore would have had on each corner a tassel. And what was the tassel for? We'll find out in a few moments. And the word for peace, a rhinon, quietness, rest, peace of mind, um, well-being, welfare. Um, in the Jewish mind, this is shalom. This is where nothing is broken, where it's undisturbed. Y Yeshua was completely at ease with her. So I don't see be a good cheer. I'm wondering if that's because in the King James it would be in italics which means that it's not actually there. It's inferenced but it's not there. Uh, I believe what it's showing is Yeshua's disposition towards her from the get-go. It's like be of good cheer. That was the impression upon Yeshua Jesus as he spoke to her. Okay so now we're gonna take a look at the background commentaries that we might use in order to understand the culture of this event and I think that's very important because if we don't know the background we may try to place our own culture our own perspective understanding when we look at the background it's going to give us fuller glimpse to the story we're going to understand it more we're going to enjoy it more because it reveals the heart of god it re reveals the condition of humanity in their pursuit for relief from pain or suffering disease we get to see firsthand the heart of god to us and to this woman so I'm using the Keener IVP Bible Background Commentary on the New Testament. And as you can see, um, I've posted an excerpt from this great resource. And basically this says, This woman's sickness was reckoned as if she had a menstrual period all month long. It made her continually unclean under the law. Leviticus 15, 19 through 33. A social problem on top of the physical one just as Jewish interpreters linked texts by a common word Luke's source may use 12 years to emphasize the relatedness of these stories okay so we see with this excerpt if she touched anyone or anyone's clothes she rendered that person ceremonially unclean for the rest of the day Leviticus 15 26 to 27 she therefore should not have even been in this heavy crowd many teachers avoided touching women altogether lest they become accidentally contaminated thus this woman could not touch or be touched and was probably now divorced or had never married and was m marginal to the rest of Jewish society this last excerpt from this resource Jewish people generally believe that only teachers closest to God had supernatural knowledge Jesus uses his supernatural knowledge to identify with the woman 
who had touched him, even though in the eyes of the public this would mean that he had contracted ritual uncleanness. Lest anyone be permitted to think that the healing had been accomplished by typical pagan magic, operating without Jesus' knowledge, he declares that it happened in response to faith. Step 9. Consult other commentaries. And that's what we're going to do right now so we get another facet of this beautiful diamond of this passage to learn more. Let's take a look at several commentaries to see if we learn anything new about this great story. Mark's Gospel 526, we didn't notice this earlier, but um, Luke, perhaps with a fellow feeling for physicians, does not add the severer comment of Mark that the physicians had only made her worse. Mark 526. The physicians' attempts to cure her had actually made her worse. But here's the part that I want us to look at. So when we come to the pulpit commentary, it has got something that's really interesting. I want to point out this little gem here from the pulpit commentary. The border of the Lord's garment which the woman touched was one of the four tassels which formed part of the Jewish talith or mantle. One of these was always arranged so as to hang down over the shoulder at the back. It was this one which the sufferer's fingers grasped. This was a certain, there was a certain sacredness about these tassels as being part of the memorial dress enjoined by the Levitical law, which no doubt induced the woman to touch this particular portion of the Savior's dress. And immediately her issue of blood stanched. Now what I'd like to show you real quickly is that the tassels, or zitzit, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the border, was commanded by the Lord to be worn by the Jewish people. Numbers chapter 15, 37 to 40, and I'll just read it to you. The scripture says, Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God I am the Lord your God. Yeshua and any Jewish man or woman would wear this tassel, four tassels that would actually be the most holy part of a person's attire because it represented the commandments and a reminder to follow the commandments. Let's summarize what we've learned today. Yeshua is on his way to help someone in the midst of a great crushing throng of people. Out of nowhere, Yeshua feels his power flow out of him. Yeshua immediately asks his disciples, who touched me? Yeshua begins to actively search for this person. The result of this is that she comes out of the midst of this crowd, prostrates herself before Yeshua, and reveals the truth. From what we read from the background information and these commentaries, when she touches his tassel or border, instead of him becoming contaminated and unclean, the power leaves him and she is made immediately well and Yeshua has nothing in him 
that would be condemning, that would put her in jeopardy. Her desperation and her faith, her trust, her belief that if she could just touch him, if she could just reach out and take hold of him, that she would be finally made well, that she could finally rejoin society and to be perhaps to marry if she wasn't already married to lead a normal life and Yeshua because of her faith she was able to move God now we know the Holy Spirit rested upon Jesus the dunamis of the Holy Spirit was upon him when she touches Yeshua the dunamis the power of the Holy Spirit the anointing went out from him into her and she was instantly healed so what were some of our questions what is this flow of blood well it was a hemorrhage and it had been made worse by the physicians how did it affect her in her culture and community well she was ostracized she would have been unwelcome she would not have been it's very likely she would have been very much like a leper pushed outward because she was unclean why did she come from behind because she was desperate and she she knew she was not supposed to be there but her desperation was fueled her she touched the border of his garment does this have any significance yes as we revealed the tassels the four tassels which speak of the commandments of God as a reminder and are considered the most holy aspect of a person's attire but in, in, instead of Yeshua becoming contaminated unclean she was healed and Yeshua's response to her when she falls down in front of him is to say daughter be of good cheer your faith has made you well go in peace so what do we draw out of this so many people in our world today are desperate desperate for God's love desperate for his attention desperate for his healing desperate for his cleansing and my friends you and I in Christ we carry within us that dunamis we are his ambassadors and we speak on his behalf Jesus is in you and he wants to use us in a way that would impact and bless those who are desperate right now God responds to desperate people and you might be desperate right now you might be in Christ and you're desperate desperate with anxiety desperate with fear desperate with bad news from a doctor or bad news from a lawyer or bad news from your wife or your husband where your marriage is collapsing around you then I dare you to reach out your hands to Yeshua the Lord the risen one and just grab hold of him knowing that he will not reject you he will not turn his back on you he will not forsake you in fact he will tell you if you just have faith simple trust just a knowing that you will be made whole you will have whatever you need whatever the need is it will be met and then he says go in peace live in tranquility live in well-being live where there's nothing broken nothing missing where you're complete and whole because he lives in you and that my friends is heaven you don't need to get to heaven to experience heaven you just need him to live in you to be welcome in you now if you've somehow got to this point in the video and so I'm going to pray for two people today I'm going to pray for you Christ follower who's in desperate straits and you need help and then after I'm going to pray for the for the one who somehow got through this video this entire video and have got reached to this moment and somehow some way this message has spoken to you 
and I want to pray for you that you would experience the same power, restoring power that we saw in this woman, this unnamed woman. Father, I lift up the Christ follower who's struggling and in difficult times right now. Lord, we all we can do is fall forward into your grace and just be like this woman who fell forward prostrated before Yeshua. We want to fall before you, Lord, and we just ask for your touch of strength right now, your encouragement and your peace. Give this to us, we pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I just want to lift up the person that has just happened to make it this far or just maybe skipped through the video and just got to this moment and heard my voice and they know they need you. They're desperate, empty, searching for meaning and purpose in life, identity, and Lord, only you can give that. Only you and your resurrection life can give us purpose, meaning, identity, legacy, and a horizon that will never end. So Lord, I just pray for the one that doesn't know you, that they would look to you right now. I pray that they would repent from their sin and they would pray this prayer. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I know you sent Jesus to die for me. You have done what was necessary to fix the problem. And so right now I repent. I'm tired of living my own way and I just cling on to you. I just believe that you died and rose again. And I want to come into your heart, Lord God. I want to know your heart and I want you to come into my heart in every area of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. Now if you do pray, have prayed those prayers, any, anyone out there, please feel free to message me. If you need any help, if you need support, I'm glad to help do my part. So feel free to get a hold of me. Thank you for your time. This has been episode one and of the scripture immersion series, digging deeper into God's word to draw out nuggets of understanding and spiritual truths. We will have another episode coming up. This episode that you are listening to now, watching now, took me over eight hours to produce. It's been a great joy to do this and I pray that it has blessed you. So use these 10 steps to study God's word. Um, you will grow quicker. Use this in your daily life. Thank you, Lord, and bless you guys.